Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. This is episode 942. In this episode, we're going to be discussing the future of the Freedium model in WordPress. We've got a friend of the show. Um, he hasn't been on the show for a number of years, but he, I still classify him as a friend. We've got Jack Alturo with us. He's the founder of a very popular WordPress plugin called WP Fusion and a plugin shop called Very Good Plugins. So, Jack, do you want to give the tribe a quick 20, 30 second intro of you? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been developing in WordPress for about 15 years now. <laughs> wow, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, before this, I was an Infusionsoft consultant, and um, I did a lot of work with marketing automation tools, um, click funnels, and, and that kind of thing. And um, I started getting into WordPress um, the way a lot of people did, setting up um, sites for clients with pre-bought themes and customize it, put their logo in, and you know, just like. Quick. Yeah, I think you're giving us a quick intro. We'll <laughs> delve more into your journey into WordPress um, after our quick commercial break. But I also got my great co-host, Kurt. Kurt, would you like to introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers, Kurt? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Kurt Vama Anan. I own an agency called Manana Nomas, and we focus largely on membership and learning websites, as well as working directly with folks at WP Tonic and Lifter LMS. Like I say, in this episode, we're going to be just discussing the freedom model we're going to be discussing jack's journey into wordpress we're going to be discussing um what the wordpress community is like in germany and a host of other topics it should be a great discussion jack has a lot of knowledge to and i think he's up for an honest discussion um but before we go into the meat potatoes of the show I've got a message from our one of our major sponsors. We will be back in a few moments, folks. Hi there, e-commerce store owner. At Omnisend, we help more than 100,000 e-commerce customers, just like you, sell their products. We're an all-in-one email and SMS marketing platform that helps you reach your customers, grow your audience, and increase sales. In fact, our customers have seen incredible results with Omnisend, averaging $72 in revenue for every single dollar spent. And if you ever have a question, our award-winning customer support team is available 24-7 every single day. That's one of the reasons we have more than 6,000 glowing reviews and ratings all across the web. So get started with Omnisend today and start growing your business with better email and SMS marketing. We're coming back, folks. Before we go into the first half of the show, I just want to point out we've got a created list of the best WordPress plugins and services for the WordPress professional, plus some great special offers from the major sponsors. You can get access to all these free goodies, and I know you like your free goodies, you WordPress professionals. You can get this by going over to wp-tonic slash dot com slash deals wp tonic.com slash deals and you find all the goodies there what more could you ask for my beloved wordpress professionals probably a lot more but that's all you're going to get from that page sorry to dis <laughs> right. um so jack um this goes straight into it so you gave us a quick intro i cut you off because you were going off into detail this is the time. So how did you, first of all, you know, get into the world of online marketing and becoming a consultant for Infusionsoft or Confusionsoft, as I call it? Um, and then how did you get into the world of WordPress as a developer, you know? Um, so first of all, how did you get into the world of um, being a marketing consultant? I found a job on Craigslist. I needed something to do and I had no formal education and somebody was offering, I think $10 an hour as an, uh, as an administrative assistant in New Mexico and they were using Infusionsoft. And so I started building all their campaigns and um, running their evergreen funnels and all that stuff. And I did that for uh, two or three years. And you still got all your hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't look in the back. <laughs> so, yeah. 
well, that's humble beginnings. Um, I want to point out I've worked with Jack on a couple of projects, and he's yeah. a very good programmer, and he's he's pretty easy to work with. Unlike some people I've worked with, uh, um, so um, that happened to be truthful about it. Jack has always been reasonable, uh, um, so that that's um, interesting beginnings. So, when did you start? programming and getting into the world of WordPress as a programmer? Um, yeah, the more sites you set up, there's always some client who wants something changed. It, this needs to be bigger. I want this to move over there. And um, if you want to get paid, you don't have a choice. So yeah, just a lot of trial and error. Um, this was back in the day when it wasn't so competitive. And I they feel like people were doing less outsourcing and they wanted to work with somebody in their um, local community. So, um, yeah, just a trial and error and figure it out as it went. Right. And so you're totally self-taught? Yeah, totally self-taught. Wow. That's amazing. Um, well, I'm amazed because, like I say, Jack's one of the be better programmers that I've actually worked with. Uh, um, is that because you probably are self-taught then, Jack? And I just do a lot of self-teaching. I don't know what they say that. What's that 10,000 hours to mastery thing? I think I hit the 10,000 hours a few years ago um, and I'm still racking them up. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. It just uh, new skills every year and incorporating them and yeah. So, so you're kind of freelancing as a developer. What led you to into your first WordPress plugin? and trying to build a business around that. What led to that? Sure. Um, I tried a couple of plugins. I, uh, around that time, I really enjoyed reading Pippin Williamson's blogs. He would do the year in review post. And um, that was really eye-opening to me. Like you could make money while you sleep and um, like you could have thousands of people using your products and, and actually like really, really make money from it. Um, so I tried a couple of plugins, um, freemium model also that didn't work um, and that's fine. Um, but uh, I kept coming back to these integration problems between clients who are using CRM software and also running membership sites. Um, so for example, somebody who was doing their marketing in Infusionsoft and they were doing courses in LearnDash and they wanted to trigger emails around student events and like somebody completes a course, they get an email, that kind of thing. So, um, these the same kind of problems kept coming up again and again um, and i kind of built a toolkit that i would start to use for each project to kind of get it off the ground and um i was working with a friend at the time on a project like this and he said why don't we go in on this and uh we can release it as a plugin and, and see if anybody would be interested in buying it and it it worked it was just i guess it was just the right idea at the right time there wasn't really much out there um for that level of integration and this was right at the time when Active Campaign had just come out and marketing automation was just taking off. It was still affordable, <laughs> not so much anymore. Um, well, you, you've got you got Fluid CRM, which of course, you yeah, wrote yeah. an excellent piece about your journey from Active Campaign to Fluent, didn't you? Yeah, don't get me started on Active Campaign. I've got some thoughts there. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think it was just good timing, and uh, so we launched W Fusion in. Um, the beginning of 2015 and it was uh basically um like 100 percent year over year growth for the first i don't know six years something like that um and we didn't e release a free version at all it was premium only from the beginning um and even then i think the entry price point was was something like 200 dollars. so it wasn't a cheap plugin by any means um but yeah people people signed up and the word of mouth was good and uh yeah it just it took off and it's it's still going really well Fantastic. Over to you, Kurt. Yeah, it's kind of ironic because now Pippin Williamson is one of my neighbors. We just moved to Kansas and I found out Pippin was here. I see your pictures all the time at the brewery. Yeah, I'm jealous. Yeah. I want to go check it out. You too much time in the brewery, Jack. That's I, a, that's I, I do kind of live at the brewery. <laughs> so um, what do you think are like, so your opinions, having released plugins and especially in the marketplace, now that we're that we're thinking of wordpress in the space um what do you think the real future is with like the freemium model of coming coming to market with a product 
offering a version for free and then trying to upsell or upgrade from that free model, you know, through the repository and stuff. Do you have, do you have thoughts around that ecosystem? Yeah. Um, I think that it's no longer possible just to release a free plugin and expect people to find it in the WordPress plugin list and the admin, um, and build a business that way. Um, you have to already have connections. You have to have a marketing strategy. You, you, the, I think the upfront costs are a lot higher, but um, but I th still think it's possible. Um, I mean, Fluent Serum is a great example. They have a really powerful free plugin that can do a lot of stuff um, and can save you a ton of money. And their um, paid versions are reasonably priced and are a great value add on top of the free well, software. Well, Joe, Joe is a great, he's been a great supporter of me. He's like you, very generous individual, isn't he? Oh yeah, he's great. I, I love, uh, I, I, he's kind of my WordCamp buddy. Every time we go to WordCamp, we hang out. Um, yeah, so I, I think that it's possible, but um, you need to have, you need to, I think, be established in the community already. And that could be as a um, podcast host, uh, Jonathan, but you need to have some um, brand recognition and some trust. Um, and then you need to release something that's solving a pain point and that gives away a lot for free. And that's difficult. I think we were really lucky and that we were profitable in the first month. And I don't think that would be possible anymore. Um, I mm -hmm. think you would need to expect to wait, you know, six months or a year and build up a user base. And, um, but yeah, I think it's, it still can be done for sure. I've always been interested in the freemium model and, and my first real experience with the freemium model was working with the folks at lifter, right? Yeah. So they have this giant, free plugin, right? And it does an amazing amount of stuff for free. And then yeah. of course people come along and they go, well, I want to sell it. Okay. Well, you want to make money with the product. So now we're going to ask you to buy a premium plugin to connect your, your thing, right? That whole model made sense to me. But if I try to reverse engineer that thought as an outsider looking in, I really struggle with how do you determine what to put in your freemium version? versus mm -hmm. a premium, right? So after the fact, I can look at Lifter's model and go, oh, that makes perfect sense. But like, I couldn't imagine putting that together. How, do you have thoughts on like how to construct the, the right pre freemium offer? And then like what's free and what's not? That, that's, that's a hard thing. Yeah, so I think that's a great example because yeah, pay, it used to be the standard was payment gateways or recurring payments if you want to take subscriptions. Um, but a lot of people might not even try it out if they can't take payments. Like you're not going to invest all your time into building a course. Like, like you, you want to have some proof that it's working and that you have a potential business there before you start to invest in paid add-ons. I think that in the last few years, it's changed quite a bit because of the Stripe Connect program. Um, so if developers, uh, for people who don't know, if developers create, um, for example, like a simple course plugin that lets you sell courses, they can sign up via Stripe and they can collect one or 2% of all of the transactions that get processed through Stripe. So we're seeing more plugins that are released completely for free with payments and recurring payments built in. Um, Surecart is a great example. And they're able to fund their growth by taking one to 2% of your revenue. And um, in most cases, that's the free plan. And then when you make enough revenue, you can upgrade to a paid license with the plugin provider and then they get rid of the fees. So I think that's a great shift because it lets you start a new online store, validate your concept and get revenue. Um, if you don't make anything, then you don't pay anything. And if you start making a lot of money, then it's worthwhile to upgrade to the um, premium version and, and uh, save yourself that percentage cut. Nice, nice. Jonathan? Yeah, obviously I think there's still some traction in this model. It's just got more competitive, like almost everything. But then you've got the elephant in the room. You've got the uh, the other element, which has always been there. But I think people decided to do a Freudian, a Freudian deal with the devil, didn't they? Um, and that um, that's reared its head in more ugliness, um, partially through your own personal decision. But I think the the more ugly, uglier aspect of this is what's happened around paid membership pro um obviously it's been reported in reddit 
so you have to take it for what it is. But I think also the owners of Paid Membership Pro have confirmed this, is that they've been, you know, they've been semi-threatened by Matt um, that their decision to remove their parking from the depository, they got threatened that he was going to do what he has done to WP Engine and their plugins. Um, I think the kind of feedback that I've got from the community over this, it, it's really put a shiver through a lot of people and it's woken up a lot of people. Have you got any thoughts around this, Jack? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a few. Huh? I thought you might. But, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm quite close with the team at Paid Memberships Pro. And I really think that, um, I, I really respect that they kind of took a stand for their principles and they said, essentially, um, you know, Matt is, has not been clear with us with who is in charge of the .org repository. Well, it, it is was, clear, isn't it? It's, it's him. clear now, yeah. yeah it's it's totally totally clear, out, isn't it? It's totally it was, clear, isn't it? It was sort of made out to be this, um, like a community, community supported collaborative um, place where people build the WordPress project together. And then when he um, stole advanced custom fields, um, he said, oh, it's a one-time thing. That would that would never happen again. It's only because of this complicated legal reason that I, I can't really explain it the same way twice. Um, and then just, and then to find out um, two weeks later, he's threatening other plugin authors with taking over their plugins. Um, I think I, I get some leads from the .org repository, but I would be happy to close our plug in there and distribute it somewhere else. I don't feel yeah, like- um, truthful, you weren't reliant that much on yeah, yeah. him and keeping on the right side of him. I yeah. say that he's quite capable of forking, you know, I, I, this is quite, I'm only stating the obvious, obviously yeah. you, you, and Jack's much more intelligent than me audience. So uh, um, he's thought of all this. Um, obviously he could still attack you quite, vigorously because he's done this before he could still take your whole plug in and offer it for free couldn't he yeah he could um and he's so quite we, capable of doing it isn't he we were lucky in that um we launched as a premium only plugin so as i'm sure you know many plugins their free version is on the repository and then the paid extensions are add-ons to that like with lifter lms um if matt took over lifter lms um the paying customers would be screwed um, with us, our free plugin is standalone because we launched it much later. So um, if Matt wants to take it over and support it and develop it, um, when the customer clicks to upgrade, they're going to come through to our website and buy the premium plugin. So I really don't mind. It would it would save us some effort. Um, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny here, Jack, because he he, he, the premium version is done under the open license. He could, he could fork your your premium if he wanted to it would cause an enormous amount of bad will he it could, would be a kind of a semi-nuclear explosion wouldn't it this is this is why i filed my cease and desist against automatic um in october he could take the plugin and completely rename it rebrand it change all of the functionality rewrite all of the documentation the tutorials open partner programs with hubspot and salesforce become a microsoft certified developer do you know everything um, but he can't legally just take WP Fusion and sell it as WP no. Fusion because we own the trademarks to that. And that is trademark infringement. Um, and we can take him to court for that. Yeah. So if he was really determined, yeah, he, he could he could fork it and call it, um, I don't know, Matt's Fusion or something. Um, but it, it wouldn't be practical. It would be a lot of work. But I will say um, we're about to launch, I'm launching a new business, uh, which is going to be a SaaS uh, service. And we'll have a WordPress plugin. We will submit it to the .org repository, but um, our primary distribution channel will be via our website. And that was made as a choice, considering Matt's actions. Um, we want to be secure in case anything else goes down on the .org repository. Um, the updates will come from our website. Yeah. Um, in some ways, in some ways, I think it's it's for the best to see the situation. I think a lot of people just 
went along with things because they were doing quite well financially and they just didn't want the aggro. But a lot of people had... I've I've not had this. I've always had a good experience with the couple of discussions I've had with Matt. But I've had a host of other people who haven't had very good interactions with him. Um, and they're but they've never been prepared to talk about in an honest way about their experiences with him. Would you agree with that, Jack? From what I've heard, he has a, a public persona and then a private persona. Um, I've heard in one-on-one -on -one meetings, he can be verbally abusive. Um, he can be a difficult person to be around. And then he has his, his keynote face that he puts on, um, which looks good and is all about you know, empowering writing and open source software. I think we're kind of getting a glimpse of that private Matt, um, especially in his social media exchanges. Um, and in just just like the weirdly vindictive actions, like the WP Engine Tracker website, or um, like the stuff that doesn't make any sense from right. a tactical or legal standpoint, it just really seems like he wants revenge, like he wants blood. Um, and it pleases him somehow to get it. Um, so I think people are starting to see that side of him that was previously only spoken about in private. All right, back over to you, Kurt. Um, okay, so if we go back to uh, the, the fact, back, back to, to the back course to at hand, if we go back to the course at hand, <laughs> you ask. Um, let, let's talk about people that want, maybe want to get into the plug-in business, right? Yeah. So, so you've got experience here. You're, you're well established, successful. You've got that. And um, what what advice would you give to that service entrepreneur that wants to market their business in 2025? Because we're coming up on the end of 2024. Obviously, we've got some instability in the WordPress community framework kind of place. People are, aren't super secure. So if someone is already put in the work and, and now they've got something to release, what advice would you have for them to market that product in 2025? That's a good question. Um, mm. I, I, think, I think the best way is to create kind of a niche product in a community where you're already established. Um, for example, uh, I'm, I'm quite active in the, um, in the buddy boss community. Um, and, uh, that my, my friend Peter's got a, um, add on that lets you customize the, um, buddy boss app in very unique ways. Um, and he came about that idea by spending tons of time working one-on-one -on -one with buddy boss app users and realizing this is something that they're missing. And he's already got the name, um, recognition and, um, I, th I think is quite successful with that. I I don't know how easy it would be to just wake up in the morning with a good plugin idea and you know just start tweeting about it. I think you have to have um, a community that you're already integrated with, identify a problem multiple people are having, and then even just develop it for one or two customers and work with them to iterate and then um, build it up into something that can be commercially viable. Yeah. It, and, and at the risk of, of saying something maybe not expected, um, even an established plugin, right? You, you want to experiment with more content. Like I know that you're working with Emily on making some like tutorials and, and short yep. YouTube things. And so that's, that's kind of a new channel for you guys, isn't it? To, to, yeah. Um, that perspective. For eight years, we did no marketing at all. I wrote one blog post a year um, that yeah. just summed up our revenue numbers and our traffic uh, kept going up. And then the Google algorithm update in, in April um, really killed us. Our traffic is down like 80% uh, over last year. And we've seen that reflected in new customer numbers. Um, our, our new customer signups peaked in like 2022 and now they're at about half of what they used to be. Um, revenue is still going up because we have a pretty um, low churn rate. Most people renew, but um, yeah, so something had to change. So yeah, in August I hired um, a marketing director full-time. Um, their name is Katie and we now have uh, two writers and Emily working with us on, um, on uh, social media and video production. And it's, it's a little bit early to tell, but um, you yeah, know, we're seeing the organic traffic start to tick back up and our pages are ranking again. So 
um, it's been a really big change and a lot of work and, and just like systematizing a lot of things that were previously only in my head. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, why would somebody want to use event tracking or like, um, you know, what's the deal stage in Zoho and that kind of thing. And so we're just, we started using um, Notion. I don't know if you know Notion, yep. we're just creating this big database of all the internal policies. I record hour long screencasts of this is how I do this specific thing um, so that they know how to do it themselves. Uh, so it's been a lot of work. Um, so with that and then launching a new company and then Black Friday coming up, I don't get much sleep these days. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the dead week between uh, Christmas and New Year's this year. Well, I, I'm taking most of December off, actually. Well, I'm working. Um, I've got a, um, I'm in a, I'm in a enormous, I wouldn't say a fight because that would be a ridiculous statement, but um, I'm in a similar situation with Google as what you expressed, but it's happened a lot later than what happened to you. Um, so I'm going to have to do a ton of work and um, a lot of that's got to be started in December. Um, but um, just to finish off, I've, I've got such mixed feelings about what has happened with Matt and WP Engine because um, in some ways I was, I know this is going to sound a ridiculous statement, Jack, but I, this is how I feel about it. In some ways, I think it's much about nothing because um, everybody knew the situation. Anybody that had a brain knew the situation because he he wants to get into a punch-up with an enormously well-funded um legally got a small legal army behind them and then wants to do things that, uh, in my opinion, aren't going to work out very well for him. Um, that's his business, isn't it? Um, but um, when it comes to WordPress, which is a much bigger thing, isn't it? Um, I actually... I was more concerned about Gutenberg and all the flux around that because I thought it made things very difficult, not for you because of the kind of plugin and your niche area, but for a lot of other plugin providers, the situation when it came to support and maintenance and making sure their plugin works, I thought because of Gutenberg and the whole situation, the situation was getting worse and worse for a lot of plugin authors and people with established business. Do you think I'm on the right track there? Yeah. Um, I mean, Gutenberg's been terrible for us. I, I can't stand it. I, I always say um, I, up until WordCamp Europe 2019, when I saw Matt's keynote speech about, um, like, you know, learn JavaScript deeply, I had no idea who he was. I, I had no idea who Matt Mullenweg was. And those were my happiest years in WordPress. It was a stable system to build on. Everything was standardized. It was reliable. Um, and then, yeah, he came in and decided, I, I guess, you know, 28% of the internet isn't enough. We need to get 40%. And to do that, we're going to have to compete with Wix and Shopify and, and all these beginner um, website building platforms. And in doing that, they introduced a lot of complexity. And they also, some people went with Gutenberg, but other people decided, um, no, we're going to do our own custom JavaScript admin framework in Vue or something like that. Or Shurkart decided for stability, we're going to run most of the stuff on our servers. It's not even you're like your data isn't even in your website um, uh, because the WordPress admin is about to break and they move that all over to React. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it just feels in both the case of Gutenberg and with WP Engine, it feels greedy. It's like, why does WordPress have to power the whole internet? I think it's at 43% right now. Like, isn't isn't that enough? Like, could we just stay there? There's work for everybody. Um, does WP Engine really have to hand over millions of dollars of their revenue every month to continue to fund Matt's project to try to take over more of the internet? Like, yeah, it, I don't know. It, it really rubs me the wrong way. All right. All right. That, that's pretty clear views. <laughs> um, um, we're going to go for our, we're gonna go for our break. <laughs> 
week. And we'll be back in a few moments, folks, for the second half of this fantastic interview. Um, I knew it was going to be a great one. Um, and it's turning out to that way. Um, we'll be back in a few moments, folks. Tired of hosting providers that can't handle high traffic loads? Convesio is here to help. Our platform can handle any amount of traffic all without slowing down or crashing. With immediate Slack support, performance optimization, and a team that thrives on resolving technical challenges, your e-commerce business is in safe hands. Learn more about Convesio at Convesio.com. We're coming back, folks. It's been a great first half. Um, I just want to point out that if you're looking for a great way to promote your plugin or WordPress service, why don't you look at sponsoring the WP Tonic Show? We've got some great packages, affordable packages. You can find more about sponsoring the WP Tonic Show and getting your plugin and service in front of a large and dedicated audience of WordPress professionals. You can do that by going over to wp-tonic.com slash sponsorship. wp-tonic.com slash sponsorship. And we would love to work with you in 2025. Back over to you, Kurt. Well, I got easy questions now. Well, maybe, maybe not so easy. I don't know. Uh, living in Germany, and and I was actually really impressed when I when I first met you at WordCamp, right? And I was like, and it was like, oh, this guy lives in Germany. I was like, that is so cool. Um, so being able to pick up and go, living in Germany for for the years that that you've been doing this, would is there a big difference you think culturally in like WordPress here in the states and WordPress? in Europe. I'll be honest, I'm not super involved in the local community here. Um, my German is not very good. Um, mm. And I kind of like to, I, I don't know, I, I keep my work life online and then my personal life stays personal. Most of my friends have no idea what I do. Um, but uh, but I, I, I do think um, labor in Germany is a bit different in the US. Um, jobs are much more secure. Um, after a 30 day probation period, when you start at a new job, you basically have the job for life. And so with people I know, we're well, used to, isn't that changing a little bit in Germany, a little bit, but it's you have a lot of protections. Yeah. Um, and, and and insurance is included and pension is included. Yeah. And, um, you know, paid holiday, like it's all guaranteed. So in the US, I think I see a lot more people um, working multiple jobs, like, you know, day job, and then they're developing a plugin on the side or freelancing, and then they feel like that maybe that could work. And then they quit and they start a company and then the company goes out of business and they start another one. And, and people are always like kind of trying out a new thing and maybe being a little bit more innovative. Um, the people I know here who are working in tech, um, they go to work, they, they do great work, and then they go home and they, they don't think about it. Um, they don't have to, you know, freelance after dinner to, uh, to make ends meet. So it's just like work in general is less important. Um, I, I know when I'm in the States, you meet somebody and they say, oh, hi, what's your name and what do you do? Um, we don't we talk, we don't talk about that here. Uh, many people I see all the time, I have no idea where they work. Um, I prefer it that way. I think there are more interesting things about me than my job. Um, so it suits my lifestyle, but it is a, it a bit different. Yeah, it's there's a big part of me that was jealous when I met you because I had just come off of a really great run with uh, both Ducati as a company and a decent run at Suzuki. <clears throat> and I got to experience cultures, you know, obviously Asia, Japan and all that. Mm -hmm. But I was still so enamored and in love with my trips to Italy and Spain and France and and things I never would have got to experience without that job. And someday I plan on retiring, like just buy a vineyard and go to go to Italy and call it done. I mean, it's just their work. That's my plan balance. too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, their their work-life balance and and like you said, their take on on life and relationship is completely different than here in the states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome, Jonathan. Well, you touched on a couple of really interesting concepts there because um, I've discussed this with other guests on the show, Jack, about. Um, the concept that there's there's a minority of people that are very active in WordPress and 
their whole reality of themselves and their social community is totally around WordPress. Mm. I, um, I'm very supportive of WordPress. Maybe the great leader would disagree with that, but I am. Um, and it's been quite good to me. Um, but I don't identify myself, my whole personality. Uh, I have friends that are totally outside of WordPress. And I actually, um, I have people like yourself and other people that I have good relationships in WordPress and that have been generous to me and I try and support them. But I don't identify myself solely around WordPress. Um, I think a lot of these people that their, their whole life seems to be around Twitter and going to word camps and talking about WordPress and then talking about word camps. They have been some of the most shocked about this whole thing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. We, I, I was on the, the WP product talk show uh, last week talking yeah, about Yes, so I listened to that. You tried to. You went on there uh, before uh, here. Jack. Um, yeah. I mean, it's. It, I think it's a very small minority of us that make our whole income from WordPress. And especially those of us now, like we're, we're a team of 12 people. So I'm supporting um, other people's uh, families as well. And it makes me very nervous when these big changes are happening at the top and the community doesn't have a say in it. Um, so for people like us, I think we're quite passionate about it. And then we do what we can on social media or on podcasts <laughs> um, to try and make others aware of the problem. But I think there's a lot of people who it doesn't really affect them. They're still either selling their plugins or, or still getting clients. Um, and it, they, it'll just blow over, I, I, I think. Um, for better or for worse yeah because it, it's really interesting uh, obviously um some people that um i well known and i do respect their opinion i don't agree with everything that comes they've might you know they've got much more knowledge i think spencer forum who's a regular on my round table show that, that you work with on a reason reasonably regular level he's mm -hmm. been very vocal that and he's got a also a lot of legal experience being that he's still uh he's not a practicing lawyer but you know, i think he's still um, i've got the term registered to practice in the law mm -hmm. um um he's been very very brilliant that in his opinion this is really going to be very painful for matt and yeah. for automatic it's gonna the outcome is bleak but in some ways, but we just don't know because I, I really don't wish Matt any, I I get no joy about him getting into difficulty because um, I don't get personal joy out of people that haven't done me any harm personally. But, I, but his actions really don't make any sense. But we're definitely in flux. But in the end, it could work out better for the WordPress community in some ways do you it could go any direction what i mean is i don't think it, it this means it's going to end up in gloom and doom in the end would you agree with that we just don't know do we yeah i agree and change is good um i kind of my ideal outcome would be that automatic gets hit with a huge fine and has to pay damages for everything they've done and, and that could be hundreds of millions of dollars and I, I firmly believe that there are investors behind Matt who, if they wanted to, um, could ask him to step down. They're kind of letting him on a long leash right now. But um, well, he came... he has publicly. I'm sorry to interrupt, Jake. But his last interview, I thought, which was very amazing, his interview at Disrupt, um, was that he's publicly stated that he personally owns 82% of automatic, which I, he's verbally said that he, um, but I find that amazing statement. Um, I really don't understand how after the kind of level of investment that he can actually own 82% of automatic. Do you? I don't. And I feel like, if there was evidence to that effect, he's 
publishes everything it says everything that's on his mind we might have seen some of it but i don't know i can't comment on no. that i do feel like um i feel like automatic is going to lose this case and i think it's going to hurt them a lot and i think that it's not a problem with automatic the company i know some great people who work there they put out high quality products and yeah. services um it's just matt that that's the problem and so my hope would be that if the repercussions are strong enough, Matt's power will become more limited. And I think that that would be better for the future of WordPress. Yeah, in some ways, I agree with you. Um, I really don't, um, I'd be surprised that it ever gets to court myself, but who knows, I would imagine this is gonna be settled. The only thing is I'm not prepared. I, I don't wish any ill to WP Engine. Um, Jason Cohen is, He's not a close friend, but I think he would be okay to say that we're friends. And as a founder of WP Engine, and um, like you, I totally respect him. Um, and he's one of the, like yourself, a very um, great, you know, I always listen to his materials that come out. But I don't have a lot of per personal engagement with WP Engine because of the people that own it you know it, it's just a business isn't it for WP Engine it's owned by a venture capitalist yeah and you know I, it's business isn't it you know they will just look at the yeah. figures won't they and I before this I really don't like WP Engine's hosting I think that it's um overpriced and it's not very powerful and they do a good job of um attracting people who don't really understand hosting, but it's a business and the business is working and it makes them money and they have every right to make money selling hosting. Um, I never thought I would be on Twitter defending WP Engine, uh, but when Matt comes after them, um, especially in a way that's not backed by any kind of um, like legal dispute, it's, it's just Matt attacking them. Um, he could do that to any of us. And so I feel like I have to stand up for them. Yeah, that, that's kind of, yeah, I think that's well expressed. Back over to you, Kurt. I really thought we were going to go for our half break. <laughs> um, if we if we dial back the questions and and wonder about some people would look at WP Fusion and consider that a piece of AI, right? They would consider that like the automation, like someone fills out this, they get that. Someone does this, this happens. Someone does this, but AI's got a whole kind of different flow how do you think um you use ai in in your daily life or in your work that does it are there special tools that you use that help you get through yeah um it's it's changed everything <laughs> i can't believe it's only been around a year i would say um in terms of coding 90 percent of my output is ai generated now um, wow. I use, I use chat GPT for general inquiries or, or like, you know, how to approach a problem. But, um, I've recently started using the, um, the cursor editor for code, which, um, it lets the AI understand everything you're working on and, and work across multiple files and make changes. Um, just this morning, we had a customer who was, um, using Zoho and they're sending WooCommerce orders into Zoho for their, um, sales team. And normally we interface with the Zoho deals module, which is like one way of seeing orders. And they're, was, they're a funny company, aren't they? they so, yeah, that's another story. Yeah, that, that, well, maybe we can discuss that. Oh, you are, you know, we're coming up. Um, we've got another ten minutes, but if you're up for it, we can do some sure. bonus content because I like they're a strange company, aren't they? They're really they could they're highly successful, but they could be so do so much better, couldn't they? Yeah. In my opinion. But um, yeah, I was just going to say the customer asked, would it be possible to send the data into sales orders instead of deals? And normally that's the kind of thing we would have to put into the queue, get five or 10 customers interested in, send it out to a developer, wait a month. And I just thought, let me just ask Cursor if it can do this, uh, make a quick change. And it did it across like six different files, edited it, added a little option to the settings. Um, when the option changes, it, it validates the different fields and makes sure they're mapped correctly. Um, so five minutes, I was able to add this feature just for this one customer uh, and send it out. So it's it's helping us do things that um, we, we probably never would have found the time to do because it's so niche, but now we're able to solve those problems for people. Yeah. Do you think using the AI the way that you do, there, there's a certain level of required expertise 
to understand the the inputs and the outputs better? Or do you think overall more and more people are going to think they're an expert in something when they really don't know what the heck they're doing? Yeah. You, that never you, stopped a load of people in WordPress. <laughs> That's never stopped them anyway. Kurt. <laughs> Well, and there's there's two ways to look at it. So the, the one is that, um, I mean, yes, yeah, certainly, like I understand how to phrase um, the question in a way that I get the result that I want. And I've, yeah. I've pre-written a script that tells it it needs to conform to the security standards and the translatability standards and the documentation standards. And But now I'm able to share that with our junior developers on our team um, and give them just like an hour training on how to work with the AI and the prompting and they're able to output code at almost the same level I can. Um, so I think that, yes, you need to know what you're doing, but it's also a great way for people who might've been too scared to even start to um, get their feet wet and realize it's not so scary. And, and yeah, you know, maybe it breaks the first couple of times, but um, you know, then you fix it and you learn more and you iterate. Whereas before you might've been too scared to ever start a plugin business. So I, I think it's, it's good for established developers and for beginners. Yeah, I, that's at, at the low level of engagement that our agency has here, we've run into a couple of times already where we've gone to work on a membership or a learning site and somebody's added some snippet or code or something. And I'm like, what, what is this? What are, what are you like? Oh, I want my dashboard on the front end or I, I want my reporting on the front end or I want my. And in the old days, you would say, well, let's get a developer to build that, right? Or let's move that. And now it's like, it's there. You go into this website and it's there and you're like, where did this come from? Yeah. And oh, I just built that in chat GPT. And you're like, oh my God, you know. It's yeah, cool. I see where you're Amazing. coming from, but that's, you know, uh, it's just changed. But, you know, they hired somebody from somewhere. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to name whatever and that you know it was two years ago and they they never paid the person because they weren't happy or they fell out as as you do and so there's nobody there's nobody to talk to anyway now it, the code is produced by machine code it's a kind of same but i see where you're yeah. coming from kurt but i've dealt so much with that scenario somebody hired there was never any doc documentation about anything you know and it's a black box isn't it jack and it's changing so quickly um like the system i'm using now has only been for about a month and before that the code we got out of chat gpt wasn't that reliable like it wasn't really worth um using a lot of times and uh really yeah probably every three months our ai integration workflow changes completely um and it's gotten uh, exponentially better yeah, it's amazing. It's, awesome. it's good to hear. Right. Um, let's go to my last question, which is one of my favorite. Yeah, obviously, you know I'm English, don't you, Jack? So are I'm you, into, really? yeah, <laughs> I've been living in America, but I'm still so English, I feel. Funny enough, my, my family in the UK reckon I've become very Americanized. Uh, um, it's most strange. Um, but I still think I'm pretty English in temperament and sarcasm. Um, so... Doctor Who and the TARDIS and H.G. Wells um, and the time machine. If you had your own time machine and you can go back to the beginning of your career, is there anything you would like to tell yourself, apart from not coming on this part, podcast, Jack? I love this podcast. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think in the beginning I was I'm, – I'm very, very risk-averse. I don't like to take chances. Um and so I wanted to do everything myself and any money we made um, went into like my retirement savings. And that was it. We were at 90% profit for years and years and years. And it was fine, but I think I was worried. It sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. but All I mean, my was... money went to my divorce. I'm just trying to, so I don't end up on the street. <laughs> But I never got to take a holiday during that time. Um, you know, I was kind of always at the whim of how many support tickets were in the inbox in the morning. Um, and then in uh, in finally in 2020, uh, Ace uh, joined us. Um, he's our support lead. And I just, I guess I was worried that bringing on help would mean I would have to spend more time in meetings and, and managing people and less time working on code. And that was kind of, Kind of made me realize that um, oh, actually, people can like take care of themselves and be responsible for their for their own tasks and and do a great job. In some cases, better than what I can do. 
And so now that we're kind of scaling up and, and the division of labor is, is figured out, I actually have more time to spend um, doing the things that interest me and less um, doing the stuff that I have to do. So I guess I just wish I'd, I'd got started on that earlier, um, building a team and, and investing more in the company. And I think we probably missed some opportunities along the way because um, it was just a full-time job, like keeping the fires from burning out of control. Um, it's something like, you know, Fluent CRM, the idea of launching a CRM inside of WordPress. I had that idea for years, but just never had time to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I would tell young Jack, um, don't be, don't be too afraid to take chances. Um, you know, you have to fail a few times to succeed. Yeah, well, I'm a kind of perfectionist because I've got this, I'm a dyslexic. And the strange thing is um, I'm a perfectionist. And that's a very difficult combination. And I, looking back, if I'd just been more acceptive, I would have done more things. But, you know, that's just great, isn't it? It is what it is, isn't it, Jack? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we're coming to the end of the podcast. I think Jack's up to um, doing some bonus content, which you can watch the whole show on the WP Tonic YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that. Please support the podcast by subscribing to iTunes and sharing it on social media. It, we're one of the few... Um, continuous podcasts that are truly independent in the WordPress professional space. Um, this is going to be our last podcast of 2024. Um, I'm taking a break, and so is Kirk. I've got a ton of work to do. Uh, I was traveling, and I still haven't made my mind up about that. I am oscillating on that. Uh, um, but we'll see. But we will be back in the new year with some fabulous guests. Um, thank you for listening to the show. I want to personally wish you and your family a happy Christmas and a new year. It's going to be an interesting 2025 for WordPress, but don't get too worried because I still feel it's the best platform to build a real online business. I honestly believe that. So, Jack, what is the best way for people to find out more about you, your thoughts and insights, which I always read myself, Jack? Um, you can find me at WPFusion, all one word, uh, dot com. Um, and that's kind of where I, I blog about the business of running a WordPress company um, and then also about marketing automation. Um, and then I have a new project that we're launching uh, at echo-dash.com. And that is going to be a real-time reporting tool for everything you do online, um, not just your WordPress website, but your Calendly events, your Stripe transactions. Um, you can forward emails into it um, and they'll appear there. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I've been working on that the last few months, echo Dash. Yeah, they're um, really Jack, and, and I've known Jack for a long time, and he's just he's just a great individual. I don't say that about many people, Jack. You can send me the check after the show, actually. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the sponsor. <laughs> and he has to deal with Spencer on a regular basis. God, you must be the a, highlight of my day. <laughs> you must be a fucking saint, actually, if you're dealing with him. Our uh, um, Kirk, sorry, Spencer, but I had to say it. Kirk, uh, um, how can people find out more about you? What you're up to? Uh, on the agency side, it's manana no mas, like tomorrow no more. Um, and we're there to help you with anything you need. And if you want to connect uh, personally, I can usually be found on LinkedIn. I'm the only Kurt Von Onen on LinkedIn, so I'm easy to find. And if you really want to support the show, why not also think about joining us on Facebook, folks? Yes, Facebook, I know. But join the Membership Machine Facebook group and you can leave some comments about the show. I'd love to get some more feedback about subjects you would like us to cover. And the best way is to join that Facebook group. We will be back in the new year. Like I say, I want to wish you and your family a great Christmas and New Year. And thank you so much for your support join 2024 it's just a, it's just gone so quick like i say we'll be continuing the discussion with jack and you'll be able to see the bonus content on the wp tonic youtube channel we see you in the new year bye this podcast episode is brought to you by lifter lms the leading 
learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. Hi. So some bonus content. You know, a lot of people are saying, what's your views on um, Zoho? Because they're, they're high, you know, based in India, private company, yeah. hugely profitable, you know, got some fantastic products, but got some really crappy products. <laughs> um, got an arsenal of different stuff. You know, talk about a company that's got, in my opinion, got too many fingers in too many pies, but they've been enormously successful, though. So what? who am I to criticise them? It, but it's just, but I always, because their, their, their main product, which is Zolo CRM that's been out around for a number of years. Right. It's quite, it's integration with your own product compared to some is extremely frustrating, isn't it? But that's down to them rather than your great product, isn't it? It's, um, I, and to be fair, I don't know much about how they work, but when I picture Zoho, I, I picture like an eight story office tower with like, 3,000 people working in it and they're all working on separate things without any awareness of what the other person is doing. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the difficulty that we have is that people see WP Fusion integrates with Zoho and we do, uh, we integrate with the CRM. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you can send WooCommerce orders into deals, but Zoho also has Zoho Books, uh, which is a separate API, different set of developers, separate website. And then they have Zoho Inventory, which does not connect to books or to the CRM. And then today, somebody asked if we could support Zoho Campaigns, which is an automated campaign builder, but it can't use data from the CRM. It has its own API. And then there's also now Zoho Commerce. So these are all, what did I say, commerce, inventory, books, CRM, campaigns, something else. And that's that's yeah. just in the marketing automation space. They've got calendar scheduling and all this stuff. So it's frustrating for me as a solution provider because you know, we, we support Zoho CRM, but not the hundred other Zoho things that you might be using. Um, they, they, I think are aware of this. They released a product a few years ago called Zoho flow, which yeah. is like a Zapier, but just between Zoho products. So we can sometimes help folks send data into the CRM and then Zoho flow it over to books to update their bookkeeping. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been frustrating to work with. Yeah. Cause they could, it's extremely for they really aim at the small entrepreneur, small business between 50 yeah. to 100 people businesses, don't they? They really have a focus around that. What's your thoughts about you know, you publicly um done some great posts about moving away from active campaign. Where do you see where they are, um, in 2024? And my a big giant very did some amazing stuff but really hasn't done too much for a while really that's my kind of apart from putting their prices up quite a lot um what what would you say about active campaign i i still recommend it um as one of the first places to look if you're new to marketing automation but i think that they kind of made a mistake with the pricing changes because they were always it kind of an entry level product with entry level support. Um, their uh, availability isn't so good. Like the system does go down sometimes. Um, emails don't send. The API times out. Like it's it's got issues. But it was worth it for sixty bucks a month um, and easy enough to use. Um, but then when they raise the price to two hundred and fifty a month, um, you know, uh, and I and I'm I've got customers who aren't getting tagged or emails that aren't going out, and I can't reach anybody on support to help me. Um, for us, it just didn't really make sense to stay with them anymore. I feel like they maybe realized that they were having too many customers that they could properly support them. So the thought might be, let's triple prices. Um, we'll kick out all of the people who aren't serious, and then we can put some real um, attention towards the, you know, like kind of enterprise level customers. Um, I hear that it's getting better. They've opened a new support center in 
Panama, I think, um, like in fully staffed. So um, they're making improvements, but for us, it wasn't fast enough. No, so a company that's always amazed me, and then I found that it was actually a, a lot of their seed funding came from Google. I think I'm right, is HubSpot. It just an um, amazing success story, but I've never really worked out why. I only presume, even though they seem ridiculously expensive for what they offer compared to Salesforce, they're cheap. So if you're looking at Salesforce, you think you're getting a bargain of the year with HubSpot. I think, how would you react to what I've just said? Where do you think they're Yeah, going? I agree. I, I love HubSpot. I wish... I've thought oh, about you it. love it. You love, I love it. Yeah. I've thought about a future where we just work with HubSpot. Um, they are expensive, but everything always works. The new features they release are well thought out. Um, in terms of the developer experience, I have a number for a developer re relations person that handles like a small group of developers. If I have any issue with the API, I can call them up. They can look at individual customer accounts and tell me what's going wrong. Um, fast responses um they uh yeah like they're they're always in touch keeping us informed on new features um it's been a wonderful experience to work with them all right um you get well, what you pay for i guess it's like, you get what you pay for i think their plans start at like 800 dollars a month for the um for the marketing automation features but mm -hmm. it just works it, it always works and if you need help it's right there when when it comes to the more traditional email um newsletter like MailChimp, Send Blue, um there's half a dozen of them. They you no, know, especially MailChimp when they got bought, I wasn't surprised that they haven't really done much because the the company that bought them, but they were in difficulties anyway, I think, in dealing with marketing automation. Were you surprised have you been surprised? Because my impression with MailChimp, normally profitable, but not really going anywhere, really. Would you, what's your own thoughts about that? So for the longest time, MailChimp didn't have any kind of automation, really. You could send um, an, an email and then another one a couple of days later. And I want to say maybe two years ago, they added a workflow builder like um, you would see in Active Campaign. I haven't dealt with them in donkey's years, though. So. Yeah. I think they got a bad reputation as being um, only for when you're just getting started. And then as soon as you need automation, you need to switch to something else. But it's actually a pretty capable platform now. Um, I've been impressed with the features they're adding. We don't. We don't have many customers who use it. I, I don't know why. Um, I haven't had any problems with it, but it just probably because they've got these, the public because they've got idiots like me spreading these legacy views and the actual situation. But they, yeah. but you know, if you go pear shape, you've got to deal with all this legacy, and it, you seem to be saying they are they have improved it. But yeah, got all and maybe legacy, no, they've got all got this legacy camera. stuff, and they from people like me, haven't they? Yeah. Um, for, for Echo Dash, we actually went with um, MailJet, uh, which is yeah. just a super basic, super cheap um, mailing list system, but it had what we need. I think we, we like $8 a month or something for 10,000 contacts, and it can do all of our transactional mail too from the app. Um, uh, so there's, there's a different solution for everybody. Um, if you talk to Uncle Spence, he can walk you through all your options. I There's maybe like Oh, he wouldn't. He wouldn't give me any advice unless I was paying for it, Jack. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, I'm such a bastard. Uh, um, it's a smile, don't I? Um, now you made you got on the wrong side of me during the interview, actually, Jack. You know your scandalous remarks, which are so common amongst developers around hosting. But I do see where you're coming because I'm a boutique hosting provider. That's mm -hmm. I kind of pick, but I'm a hybrid. I'm trying to add additional functionality. Um, is that when you've got a boutique hosting provider in a particular sector, which is membership, buddy boss, that kind of sector, learning management systems, um, we deal with a lot of support tickets you know because they're if they pay yearly on the starter plan that they're, they're getting charged 35 dollars a month if they want to go month to month it's 55 but we give them the email 
generous marketing and transactional email limits. We set it all up. Okay. We yeah. provide them with a library of plugins that I bought the license or people like you were generous and gave me a lifetime license. Um, and we provide them really quality support, mm -hmm. right, to a certain level. And, you know, we're not going to build a whole website for them because they're paying us $55 a month if they want to go month to month. But we provide specific templates that we've built ourselves upon cadence right yep but you seem to say that um that you think coast so we're on the premier side of what we charge um but we provide a lot of value um kirk thinks we're ridiculously cheap um but you seem to suggest that hosting is ridiculously overpriced and i see where you come from because a lot of these hosting they're pretty bad aren't they but on the other hand i think you're taking out of context that and also a lot of these hosting providers don't provide really good support but if you are providing good support and that it's got to show in what you're charging. Can you see where I'm coming from, or am I? Flinching? Yeah, no, and I, I think, um, I mean, that's that's the argument for managed hosting, and I have no problem with managed hosting. Yeah, um, but that's become totally discredited that term, hasn't it? We say hosting plus because I didn't want to use right. the term managed hosting, WordPress managed hosting, because what does it mean now? I think. I mean, maybe there's a better word for it, but I think a lot of customers like to know that if there's a problem, they can just talk to somebody and get the problem fixed and not, um, I mean, you know, we manage our own hosting, but we have to spend time resetting permissions on the file system and um, updating system software. And you stuff like have that. this problem yourself with, with your plugin, because you do provide, you've always provided my impression, really great support support at a ridiculous level sometimes where do you draw the line yourself or like i say i have a if we update a plugin if they just got the basic hosting plan we update all the plugins once a week and if there's a problem they have to self-report it mm -hmm. and if it looks like it's a plug the plugins that we've supplied we'll sort it out if they if they want us to check over the website, have a staging site, they've got to pay for a, a support plus package. And if they're making money from their website, we don't tell them, but we we through our in through our communication with them, we make it clear that if they want a certain level of support they're going to have to pay extra because they're making money from their website how do you how are you rationalize are there any bound are there any clear boundaries in your own company where you won't go or is it on an individual basis that boundary there's almost no boundary <laughs> we do a lot for people um yeah, writing, you do. writing custom code um oh my fixing, God. we fix we fix bugs in other people's plugins and then um, send that fix to the other company to let them know that they caused a problem but i will say that um as a developer if we have the same issue come up in two tickets that's that's a technical problem. Like that's something that we need to solve. Um, right. If somebody doesn't understand why their data isn't syncing in the right way, um, we can code a solution to that so that the the plugin explains to them what's going wrong and, and how to fix it themselves. So I'm I'm quite active about that and trying to get ahead of people ever having to contact us in the first place. Um, and so we're actually our support volume is um, lower than it's ever been. Um, oh, it's good news. So, and it's just like, anytime a problem comes up, we try to find a way to avoid turning into a ticket. Well, I suppose it's, you're not, you're not a charity, are you? But I suppose the benefit is you want them to use your plugin. If they're not using the plugin in an active way, then they're going yeah, to, and, 
that in right. the end it will mean that they they won't renew their subscription, will they? And nobody wants to get some error message at 8 p.m. on a Friday and have to you know go find our contact form and where's their license key, fill it out, and then wait until Monday to get an answer or more. I mean, we reply to people next business day, which is faster than a lot of companies. You but, do. Um, I know you do. That, that experience is unpleasant. So anything that we can do to uh, avoid that, whether it's writing more documentation or um, a lot of times we we have a, we have lists of other plugins we know that cause issues with, um, for example, uh, with LearnDash and, and their um, WooCommerce subscriptions add-on. We know bugs uh, that are created by that plugin, and we have warnings in WP Fusion to let people know that that combination is going to cause them problems, even though it's it's not related to us at all. Um, just because people reported it to uh, us. Uh, you think they would get that fixed, wouldn't you? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe they will, but uh, well, yeah, they're, pretty, so just... they're pretty well funded, aren't they? Yeah. Right, there we go. All right. Um, where do you see marketing? Ultimate, you know, is everybody looking at everybody else? Because it's a difficult. Because they've got AI. They've got yeah. this. You know, you're building by yourself. You know, you're looking at another product yourself. If, but am I right? I get the feeling that all the big players, they're all looking at one another. They're all developing in-house stuff. Um, it's it's almost like when it comes to marketing and automation, nobody, I don't feel anybody, because it's been so quick in some ways, hasn't it? And, I, um, do, you know, uh, do you know Bento? Uh, yes, Je a little Jesse bit. Jesse Hanley? I really like what they're doing over there. Uh, he and I talk a fair bit, and Jesse doesn't look at all at his competitors. Um, he works one-on-one -on -one with customers, and when they have a problem, he solves them. And they've come up with some really clever stuff, like if you tag a customer as a, as a new lead, they have a thing called tag decay, where that customer will decay out of the tag over time. Um, nobody else is doing that. He's got a system where instead of when you send an email campaign um, at all hitting inboxes at once and, and possibly looking like spam to Gmail, it batches it up into batches of 100 emails and sends them every 30 minutes. So it looks more natural and you get less likely to be flagged. And um, he's not borrowing this from other people. He's just sitting down, um, talking a customer through their problem and then finding an original solution to it. Um, so I, I, really like, I really like talking to people who think like that and work like that instead of just like, oh, what's Active Campaign doing? Let's copy them. What about how... How will WordPress cope with this? Because I think there's some structural, you know, the model of a page builder and a set of starters, and then you have these separate plugins. Um, I think it, because of that model, I think it's hard to integrate AI in an effective way. So I really, the only way that can be countered, I'm really interested in your view on this because I've been thinking about it a lot, is a more kind of hybrid system where you provide a more integrated solution but with the flexibility of the, of the customer being able to use external plugins but you provide a more niche and integrated solution that, in the WordPress platform that enables you to do more effective stuff with AI. Is this making any sense to you, what I'm outlining? Yeah, and I think, I don't know how much, like Elementor I think has an AI page builder, but I don't know how good AI is going to be at building your website. But no, I think, I, I think of, that's probably been overestimated, isn't yeah. it? Um, but for example, with Echo Dash, so um, it's a it's a reporting tool. But our kind of unique value proposition with it is that you can send any data into it, and we use OpenAI to figure out the contents of your email or your your webhook or your whatever, um, and summarize it into important points and metrics, and then display those in charts. So if you want to send your Amazon shipping notification emails into it. Um, it'll figure out when the when the package is arriving, what the tracking number is, and what the order total is, and then it'll figure out all of your Amazon orders for the last month and show a chart with how much you've been spending. Um, and that's been a really interesting application of AI because it's it's not really creative work. Like the AI is good at that. You can give it a big piece of text and say, "Tell me what's important about this," and it does it consistently um, and fast and cheap. So I think we might start seeing more. AI integrated in that way, like we're trying to solve the problem of 
if you're running a business, there's too much information coming at you all the time. Um, how can we show you what's important unless you yeah. act on it when you need to? And um, well, I think curation is going to be the biggest story yeah. around using AI, isn't it? Because I think when it comes to social media, news, what you've outlined big word in the next couple yeah. of years is going to be or yeah then also it? even yeah I and mean, if we're talking about um keeping track of your business take all those events and then have the ai summarize it into a daily report and you can get an email to say um here's what's uh, happened yesterday and here's what's important today um that kind of thing so it's it's good at that kind of work i don't think it's going to be building websites anytime soon yeah I always thought because um what um ben from cadence wp you know, I've got a lot of time for Ben because, you know, he seems a great guy. And when he Stella bought him, you know, um, and it's just like um, my mind's gone blank. The fa the founders of Give WP, they're great guys, you know. Oh yeah, um, mm -hmm. Devon and Matt. Yeah, Devon. You know, I, I'm very friendly with Devon. Yep. Um, he's always been very supportive of me. Yeah, um, he's great um you know ben but i've not agreed with the way that they have tried to use ai in building websites i understood why they were doing it um because i i think having a great library of start themes and and also the great thing that's um cadence they opened their they enabled apis um functionality that enable third party to build and sell starter themes themselves, mm -hmm. which is the great strength of Divi, which Divi understood. Um, even though I, I love the Divi people, the founder has never agreed to come on the podcast. He's made it clear he's got no interest ever coming on this show, um, which is, is you no, know, which is fair enough. But I love the Divi people. I hate the product. You know, I I despise the product. I've got to be honest with it. It's, but they're lovely people. But they, but he really knows. He built a fabulous business because he understood. He he's one of the first. He really understood his user base, and he enabled third party people to build a whole platform based on Divi and Cadence yeah. doing the same thing. But I didn't. I don't agree with Cadence going down this AI that I builds think, websites because um, I don't really think because you got it doesn't really the start of the start of websites do that really don't they? I think everybody thinks it's really cool and they want to play with it and they're trying to find a way to put it in their tool. I um, we use Affiliate WP for our affiliates, yeah. And I noticed the other day when I get a new affiliate application. It just says, it says the name of the person and the reasons for joining our affiliate program. And I can either say accept or reject. And now they've added a button that says review affiliate with AI. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, Jonathan Denwood, WP Tonic, I'm going to write about you on my blog. And, and I'm like that unsure about it that I need to send it out to chat GPT and get a robot assessment. I can just see somebody being like, we need to integrate AI in this product in some way. How about well, there's, there's been a lot, there is generally so, a yeah. ton of that, isn't there? Um, but I, I think like once the initial hype wears off, uh, I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are applications for it inside of WordPress for managing data that we haven't thought of. I would love to see an AI solution for writing alt text for my images um, for accessibility. Oh. I, I've heard some people working on one, but I haven't seen one I like yet. Well, that's, that's a like big a, area, isn't it? Because accessibility has been yeah. terrible in world. Um, and that's a and, thing that, like, no, I have to do manually. The, and, that's yeah. another area which it's just been a disaster with Gutenberg, hasn't it? It wasn't that yeah. great anyway. And then they, they put a ton of stuff on top. And the funny thing with Gutenberg is, you know, you were much stronger in your criticism. Um, I I... I always thought I could understand why he wanted to do it um, because the editing experience with native WordPress was a joke, but I think it should have just been kept in a plugin, but yeah. he, but I think that decision to put it in core was totally commercially driven. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I use cadence because it's under Ben's control. So I'm not, I'm trying to, and I really got, I really started to like 
using Cadence and I use Beaver Builder and I use a bit of Animator. But I like, I've really got to like Cadence. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't want to go down, expose myself to full site editing and the, and no. the constant changes that they're it's going always through. breaking. Yeah, yeah. I just can't deal with that, and nor can I, deal, can I recommend it to clients. Well, and for, for example, the WooCommerce um, product editor is about to be changed to Blocks, and we have a pretty close integration with that, um, with WP Fusion. And I met with um, Stephanie Pai, who's leading that project at WordCamp Asia in uh, February. And I said, yeah, you know, we're a little bit worried because you're going to change all this interface and you haven't added any backwards compatibility. So one day, um, you know, our customers are going to update and it's, it's just going to be missing. And um, the response was like, the future is coming, get, get used to it. Like, we, we don't care um, if you don't want to update your, uh, to integrate with our super complex um, React driven block system, then you're just out of luck. Um, I, I just don't like it. It's it's it feels really hostile to the developer community and, and to people who spent like a lot of time. You know, people choose WooCommerce because we provide this functionality, um, and now WooCommerce is saying, "Yeah, we're going to break all that, and we don't really care." Oh right, I bet that was a joyous moment, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. I think we're going to wrap it up. You've been generous with your time, and you must come back in the new year sometime. I've yeah, I've sure, really enjoyed our conversation. I think we've covered a ton of stuff. We're going to end it now, folks. We'll see you in the new year. See you soon, folks. Right. Bye. Thanks, Jonathan.